Thank you. Thank you again very much for, uh, for, for joining me for, for this panel, for the opening panel um, of the forum. We'll be looking at what the three institutions, NATO, European Commission, and uh, the, the government of Romania, are doing, have been doing, are planning on doing uh, when it comes to when it comes to re resilience, and in order to tackle all of this, not only the ideas, as I was saying earlier, but also the actions behind these ideas, we have with us. We have the honor of having with us very uh, three very important distinguished guests. We have the Vice President of the Commission, uh, Maros Stefkovic. We have the uh, NATO Secre uh, Deputy Secretary General Mircea Joana, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Romania, Bogdan Aurescu. Uh, um, Mr. Mr. Jonah, I would like to start with you uh, because NAT NATO uh, has been putting quite a lot of thinking into resilience. There has been a summit which mentioned resilience. There is a NATO action plan looking forward to 2030, which is, which is named uh, towards a more resilient alliance. So there's been a lot of effort and, and, and thinking. How does resilience look from where you are now in Brussels at the NATO headquarters and what, what needs to be done to, to increase it even further? Uh, thank you, Alina. Uh, uh, Maros, so good to, to be together with you. And uh, Bogdan Aurescu, thank you for your constant leadership uh, on these very important topics. By the way, tomorrow we'll have uh, the foreign ministers' meeting of NATO, also the defense ministerial of NATO, paving the way to the NATO summit on June 14th. And uh, Florin Pogonaru and our uh, Aspen team, uh, also Alina, the GMF Bucharest office, thank you so much for being such staunch uh, and perseverant uh, actors in, into all this. And I'm here in my first official, official visit to my home country, which is pretty weird, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And uh, I'm here basically for, for, for three reasons. Number one, to, to be part of the third part of the most important NATO exercise of the year, Steadfast Defender 21. More than 28,000 Allied troops from all Allied nations, uh, from the United States to Portugal and Spain and all the way to the Black Sea um, for, the, for, the, for three weeks or more, will be doing the most important deterrence and defense exercise. Secondly, because I received this wonderful uh, invitation from Minister Aurescu for the launch of the Euro-Atlantic Resilience Center that the Romania is proposing. I understand that this is something that will be offered both to NATO, and we are looking forward with anticipation to this partnership, but also to uh, the European Union. And I'm very happy that uh, Vice President uh, Sefcovic is here because he's doing a lot of work, the dashboards, uh, it's very important for NATO and EU to, to basically work together and uh, I'm convinced that this new center uh, in Bucharest will be, will be doing this for, uh, for NATO, for the EU and also for other uh, like-minded organizations and, and, uh, and partners. Now coming back to, to resilience, um, you know, this is now uh, the buzzword. Everywhere you go there is something on resilience. Uh, that's a very fashionable term these days. But the beauty of NATO is that we've been working and thinking ahead on resilience since 2016. At the Warsaw NATO summit, the leaders, in a sort of a foresight, Marosh, in a sort of anticipating some trends in a way, they instructed us, NATO, to start looking into resilience. What does it mean? And of course, like a very serious, organized, structured organization, we started to look into a few of the components of resilience as we understood it in 2016. We identified, as Alina mentioned, seven baseline requirements on resilience from everything from continuity of government and governmental services in times of crisis, all the way to civil military cooperation, transportation, energy, telecommunications, and everything in between. But then this pandemic that is still unfortunately with us came and struck all of us, all over the world, but also across Europe and across the transatlantic community. And we started to, 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 to look with even more intensity uh, to how can we make sure that the, these indicators of resilience can be developed 
can be broadened and can also be more helpful to the nations uh, part of the alliance. So I spoke a little bit about the summit on June 14th. Uh, we'll be coming with renewed political energy. Secretary General in his NATO 2030 uh, proposal for the future of the alliance has put a big emphasis on resilience. We anticipate that our leaders, President Johannes, in the case of, of representing Romania at the summit, to give us the green light to go to the next uh, uh, iteration of uh, resilience indicators. We are now working, as we speak, on a resilience pledge, very similar to the cyber pledge that we have adopted a few years ago, also in Warsaw, when cyber was part um, of the discussion. And also, of course, we recognize the sovereign right of nations to look and into its own resilience. But I think NATO, and I think the EU, is a unique platform to making sure that we are approaching resilience in a very integrated uh, and a very lessons learned kind of mode. I work with the, with the uh, Vice President uh, Sefcovic also institutionally, not because we are friends for many years. We've been knowing each other for, for many, many, many decades already, Marosh. <laughs> um, but luckily enough, we are both on, on the two sides of Brussels, myself in NATO, when Jens Stoltenberg asked me to pay special attention to NATO-EU relationship, which I do, and Maros Sefcovic in his inter institutional capacity. And now we are working uh, hopefully, even after uh, the summer, before the summer break, into some form of structured dialogue between NATO and EU on resilience. And again, we anticipate that the input from the mm -hmm. resilience center uh, that will be kicked off today uh, in Bucharest will also be part of this, of this conversation. So to cut a long story short, NATO is always adapting. NATO is always about anticipating threats. And the name of the game is that while we do deterrence and defense, which is something that is the bread and butter of this alliance, that's why steadfast defender, that's why so many things we do, we also have to look into the broader definition of security. Mm -hmm. Resilience, new technologies, climate change and security, space, these are uh, 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 a new definition of security. And again, we count on Romania, a uh, valued ally uh, in NATO, and I think a very, very active EU member state. And to close, something about technology. I applaud the fact that Romania was able to convince and to uh, obtain uh, the European Union Cyber Competence Center in Bucharest. That's a huge achievement. Mm -hmm. And I speak now putting aside my NATO hat and taking back my national hat a little bit. And I do believe that when the two centers will be up and running, the resilience center and the cyber center, this will be also the beginning of an ecosystem of innovation. And if you want sophistication in this new definition of security, and I'm happy to see that newer allies into NATO and newer member states into the EU are also coming uh, to a level of maturity and, and influence uh, in both organizations. So I'm here to, to applaud this initiative from Romania and to say that uh, we are interested in, um, in supporting it and also uh, making sure that it serves both NATO and the EU and other interested partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary General. Mr. Vice President um, Sefcovic, in, in one of the papers, in one of the reports which was published by, by the Commission on Resilience, I found the most interesting definition of resilience, and I will, I, will, I will quote it. Ability to withstand and cope with challenges, but also to transform in a sustainable, fair, and democratic manner. Um, tell us a little bit about how resilience is being seen from, from where you sit. You have a huge portfolio, which includes a strategic foresight, which I find absolutely fascinating. I hope that you can share some of, some of the steps you want to take um, in this regard um, with, uh, with, our, with our listeners. Um, what is resilience for the European Commission? Is it different from the one from NATO? You have four fields you have identified for resilience. Uh, NATO has seven uh, key, uh, key requirements. Um, how is resilience from where you sit, and how do you, how do you coordinate it with other institutions, yeah. NATO, uh, first and foremost? Well, first and foremost, thank you very much, uh, Alina, for the word, but I really would like to thank uh, Bogdan and Mircea for the kind invitation. I have to say it was my 
foreign trip after many, many <laughs> months. So we kind of are getting back, <laughs> hopefully, to, to normal also with our uh, intensive contacts, with our uh, with international uh, travel and kind of catching up where we, where we kind of uh, left uh, from uh, before the COVID, COVID crisis, which kind of put us into this uh, online world from one day into another. And if you look at uh, COVID-19 uh, and the assessment, what this phenomenon kind of caused uh, to, the, to the mankind, so very often you have such a two major characteristics. One, that it served as a, as a great accelerator of positive and negative mm -hmm. trends. I mean, we uh, just had to submerge from one day into another to do everything online, even to talk to our loved ones. Uh, the kids had to learn uh, through the computer screens, and we, we had to run the business, governments, and international organizations through these uh, online, uh, online chats. But also, it uh, um, also accelerated, uh, uh, I would say, growing gap between have uh, and have nots. We saw what kind of uh, strain it puts on a democratic uh, uh, running uh, of uh, the societies. And uh, another characteristics, I think, which is also very much present, and I think we, we still feel the shockwaves, is that uh, uh, the COVID-19 is also perceived as a great divider that it's kind of brings this divide into the societies. We see, you know, how difficult it was for the democratically elected governments to find the right strategies, how, uh, how uh, you know, we're still struggling to make sure that also developing countries would have the adequate number of the vaccines so we can, like, like cope with this, uh, uh, with the biggest health crisis ever uh, uh, we had uh, uh, in, uh, in our world. So, I mean, this is a really completely new situation, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, we had to learn how to act in this uh, new environment. And, and therefore, in my case, I'm the, the first uh, commissioner ever responsible for strategic foresight because we felt, and our president, Ursula von der, uh, von der Leyen, as, as a former defense minister, also felt that we need a better ability for anticipatory governance. Mm -hmm that we have to kind of use that huge brain potential we have in the European Union to kind of peek over the horizon, look around the corner. So we would not be surprised by, you know, uh, this, uh, this mega crises which are affecting our daily lives as it was with financial crisis, migration crisis, and now with COVID-19 uh, crisis. So therefore, we are now trying to link up uh, all the, I would say, big brains, big institutions to work together on making a foresight uh, uh, much better and much more present uh, in uh, our decision making. When I'm talking uh, to my colleagues, I'm always uh, explaining that uh, for foresight to be strategic, it has to be politically relevant. It has to bring uh, the uh, value added to the decision, uh, decision makers and uh, policy makers. It, uh, it has to be very, very practical in, in, in what we do. And therefore, also, our first strategic foresight report was exactly on resilience. And the decision uh, was taken after, I would say, the first uh, dramatic months we have seen in Europe, where suddenly we realized that the global value chains are not working as they're supposed to do, that uh, suddenly interrupted transport lines uh, caused huge problems with the uh, health protection material. We discovered that, uh, you know, some medicaments we are not producing anymore in, in, in Europe, and simply that it was affecting almost every value chain uh, which we have in the, in the European Union. And therefore, I think that the world resilience became part of uh, our policies, and we are now assessing uh, and treating resilience, as we call it, as a strategic compass for all our policies in the future. And of course, natural partner for that would be the NATO, and therefore I was uh, so pleased where my mere chair came to the position of Deputy Secretary General because not only we know each other for ages, but I know that he knows both worlds of NATO and EU very well, and we can actually uh, work on this uh, structured cooperation for the future. I'm very impressed uh, by what uh, Romania is doing in this area, and that Romania is actually investing a lot in uh, Europe and Romania being, being more resilient. So we already mentioned the, the Cyber Security Center. I'm very glad that I could participate at the opening of this uh, Euro-Atlantic Resilience Center because this is exactly uh, areas where we need to work together. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that Romania was not kind of waiting until we will have an overall consensus, but just simply did go for it. And I think that's, that's uh, very important. 
And if you, if you, uh, if you mentioned uh, the importance uh, of resilience and, and foresight, I think that in Romania you also feel that you are in a very strategic location, that the Black Sea Basin is kind of becoming this uh, cross, uh, crossroad of uh, geopolitical competition, not only because of energy or transport infrastructure, but also because of political interest of these major uh, powers. And unfortunately, speaking about the Great Divide, we see that we are kind of in a period where we are departing from multilateral to more multipolar world, where we have these competing big powers. And we, I think, as democracies, as the EU, as a NATO, simply have to be better prepare for it. And therefore we went uh, for also a bit more scientific approach how to assess our resilience. So we went for these uh, four major uh, dimensions, uh, green, digital, uh, societal, social, and uh, geopolitical, mm -hmm. where we also want to kind of present the picture how the EU looks like uh, um, member states to member states, but also EU vis-a-vis -vis the major uh, uh, competitors. And we hope that it would also serve us as a good mirror when we will be investing this unprecedented uh, amount of public finances, is 1.82 trillion uh, euros into kickstarting of our economy in the form of the next budget and, uh, and, and uh, recovery and uh, resilience uh, facility. Are we progressing in being more resilient or not? And I think we would need very honest discussion about how, this, uh, uh, how all these finances will be spent. Maybe two pieces of the information and suggestion again to uh, our colleagues for cooperation. It was, I think, 10 days ago when we had our informal meeting of the ministers for European affairs. We established uh, what I call the network of the ministers for the future. Because I think that in each government, we need a minister who would be kind of responsible for f a strategic foresight, collecting all the great ideas for the institutes uh, like Aspen, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, different think tanks, also from private sector, because very often they are very good in, in uh, uh, projecting what is, what is uh, ahead of us, and uh, kind of filtering them out, what are the most important pieces of information the policymakers uh, uh, should, should have and should work with. And I know that in NATO you are thinking about resilience, the minister, so I think it would be maybe good to get these mm -hmm. uh, two structures, ministers for future, minister for resilience, to actually talk to each other and, uh, and work, uh, work very closely, and I think that it would definitely uh, bring uh, very uh, positive results. And the last uh, uh, piece of information I would uh, share with you is that from all that uh, analysis which we did over the last year, we decided to have the next annual strategic foresight report on the open strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. So exactly to define what it means uh, that we've been always uh, for, the, for the free trade, but now we are also adding the word fair free trade. So we will not be kind of subject to hostile takeovers by the international giants subsidized by cheap governmental money putting our, let's say, critical infrastructure uh, under, under uh, a lot of uh, uh, stress. Uh, at the same time, to look for all the uh, critical products and materials we need for our, uh, I would say, economic uh, performance and, and uh, for our sovereignty and to make sure that we are masters uh, uh, of uh, our destinies uh, also in the future and just simply uh, to, be, to be able uh, to, ma uh, to make sure that uh, uh, that strategic autonomy, which, as I was uh, reminded by our Greek colleagues, uh, comes uh, from a, a Greek word uh, which says uh, liberty of action, that we would, be, uh, we would have the freedom to act at our own terms. And I think that's something very important, and I'm sure that we will have occasion to discuss our uh, strategic foresight report on open strategic uh, uh, autonomy at some of our next discussion. But thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you and looking forward to the report. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Minister, um, I think Romania is doing one more step in proving that resilience is not only a buzzword. And there have been a lot of, um, as I mentioned already, actions and thinking in translating this somewhat into, into practice. Please share with us what Romania has done, what Romania is planning on doing, and how, how all of this is, is going to get in shape. Well, first of all, thank, thank you so much for um, inviting me today. It's a, it's a great opportunity and really honored um, to be on the same stage with um, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO and with the Vice President of the uh, Commission 
for institutional relations and foresight. Um, it's a great opportunity to discuss about um, the way uh, for the um, uh, NATO and the EU uh, respond to these challenges because the, uh, well, this is the, uh, the title of this um, um, panel, Responding to Challenges in a post-pandemic world. And um, indeed, um, I think the, um, the focus put on resilience in both EU and uh, NATO frameworks uh, and the fact that Romania has embarked on this um, uh, well, um, project of creating a Euro-Atlantic Center for Resilience is in fact the result of um, a reflection process that um, was started last year. Um, and um, this was of course prompted by the pandemic. Um, and um, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs I have um, created um, already um, in the first month of uh, the last year a task force uh, to discuss and think um, and, well, foresight. <laughs> um, what could be um, the answer and the reactions and, and how to adapt after the pandemic uh, our action, uh, the um, diplomatic um, thinking and uh, at the same time the diplomatic uh, activity. Uh, how to adapt to these uh, new challenges which are coming from various uh, you know, corners, from uh, consular affairs and the need to um, well, help uh, in, an, in a more efficient way our citizens abroad, uh, which were stranded in some um, well, um, very far away corners of the world, to um, adapting our uh, core diplomatic action to this new uh, reality. At the same time, within uh, uh, NATO and within the European Union, the same uh, well, reflection process started. And now we are in a, in a very interesting uh, well, inflection point. If we uh, take a look at the fact that, on one hand, within the EU, we have started the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe, which will be the great opportunity for um, everybody, citizens, institutions, states, parliaments, governments, uh, civil society, to, um, well, uh, think uh, in a collective manner on uh, the new, uh, uh, well, European Union and how to make it more efficient, closer to the citizens, um, more uh, able to respond to the security and prosperity needs uh, of the citizens on the street. On the, on the other hand, we have um, the um, NATO 2030 process, another very important reflection process started last year, and um, uh, this um, uh, is coming on, and we will have the opportunity, um, for instance, tomorrow during the two uh, uh, foreign affairs and defense ministerials to uh, uh, discuss um, where we are with this um, uh, reflection process and uh, how um, the um, uh, well, preparation for the summit is going on. Then we will have the summit on the 14th of June, and that would be another great opportunity for our leaders to um, um, uh, well, take important decisions uh, on uh, making NATO uh, more relevant politically, stronger militarily, and uh, with a more, um, well, global uh, projection. And uh, we will have then uh, the new strategic concept, because um, I hope and I'm um, um, very much convinced that uh, this will be perhaps the most important decision of the summit on the 14th of June in, uh, in Brussels. And I'm very glad that last, uh, not last year, sorry, I'm still thinking of the last year, uh, it's, it's in my mind, uh, 2020 cannot be erased just like that. In, uh, in uh, 2019, during the um, uh, NATO ministerial at the end of the year, I think I was the first uh, uh, foreign minister to ask for a new strategic concept to be uh, uh, prepared. And I'm glad that now it's, well, becoming, uh, well, reality. And this process of negotiating a new strategic concept of the alliance will be again one, uh, one very good opportunity for uh, the alliance to uh, be able to uh, shape its response, including to the challenges which ask for more resilience. So this is how the resilience became uh, so important. Resilience uh, means, um, uh, well, first of all, putting into, um, uh, well, the best shape the um, good uh, reactions that we had um, out of the crisis, uh, more solidarity, more international cooperation, at the EU level shaping the EU for health, uh, well, program. And um, I think we need uh, more, uh, well, of that uh, in, the, in the near future. In NATO to see what was the, uh, well, the response uh, to the needs of the member states and the partners. And we had the um, uh, NATO trust, uh, pandemic tr trust fund, which uh, was very um, uh, effective in helping uh, the uh, allies and partners. Uh, we have, um, uh, well, used the strategic airlift uh, capability of NATO to transport uh, essential medical equipment um, uh, that we need. For instance, we were, Romania, the first uh, uh, country, uh, member state of NATO, to use the strategic airlift capability to bring uh, essential medical equipment for, from South Korea uh, during the pandemic. Um, then we have, of course, helped others uh, because we were also the first EU 
member state to use um, the um, uh, rescue uh, mechanism, and we have helped uh, also member states and, uh, and partners. So this is, this is extremely important. All these uh, processes are well coming together. And um, uh, on one hand, um, as I mentioned, we need to uh, make best, best use of the good practices that we have uh, developed and the good responses that we had. On the other hand, to counter uh, those reactions which were uh, not the right uh, answers, because we have seen uh, unilateral approaches, individualistic uh, well behaviors. Uh, we have seen this uh, uh, tendency to use the pandemic um, by, well, not like-minded actors, um, to put it diplomatically, um, um, in, a, um, in a way to um, uh, influence uh, our decision-making process in both foreign policy and security uh, affairs. And we have to resist to that. So uh, resilience means also um, working together with the like-minded partners. This means also working together with the United States. Uh, and this uh, goes, uh, well, uh, both for NATO, because the transatlantic partnership is the uh, backbone of the alliance and of Article 5. But it goes as well um, as far as EU is concerned, because we need a transatlantic link. We need the, this partnership being uh, reinforced, and I'm, I'm so glad that um, we will have, um, well, just back to back with the uh, uh, NATO summit, the EU-United uh, States uh, summit. So um, all these, uh, well, um, well uh, alignments um, show us that uh, we are at an important uh, inflection uh, point, and Romania is ready to play its uh, role. So you mentioned already it's not a secret that today we will... Um, uh, have the great pleasure to um, um, inaugurate the headquarters of the um, uh, Euro Atlantic Center for Resilience, this, this project that we were working for already for, I think, nine months mm -hmm. uh, now. Um, it was a process which uh, came up with uh, just only an idea, uh, taking a, a look at the um, um, international environment uh, in, the, uh, well, in Europe, at the Euro Atlantic uh, uh, um, well, space. And, um, we thought that it is important to uh, create um, a body um, which, uh, of course, does not compete with other, because there are also some other uh, excellence centers or other centers which are covering some uh, important aspects, uh, responding to um, the set of challenges that we are now um, uh, facing, um, but to uh, focus on specific uh, areas. And um, uh, we will focus on um, societal resilience, we will focus on resilience um, of our partners uh, from uh, uh, well, negative interference from outside the Euro-Atlantic um, and European uh, space. Um, and uh, in here it's normal that um, if we want to be uh, resilient, our, our neighbors and our partners in the neighborhood should be resilient as well. We have to help them uh, build their own capacities for resisting to and responding to this uh, 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 risks, challenges, and, and threats. We will focus on the resilience of uh, uh, infrastructure, communication infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure. Uh, we will focus on some other uh, well, um, clusters of, uh, of interest. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, for instance, the response to um, uh, emerging and to disruptive technologies. Um, so all these will be uh, shaped in seven uh, working groups or community of interests within um, the uh, Euro Atlantic Center for uh, Resilience, and we will try to attract uh, not only uh, the best Romanian uh, experts um, in this area, but uh, our uh, goal is to uh, make it international and attract um, experts from uh, the EU member states, from the NATO member states, and from our partners uh, in uh, the region. So this is in a nutshell uh, where we are with the center. I hope that um, um, today we will be able, of course, during the um, inauguration ceremony to um, explain more about the uh, relevance of uh, this uh, center. Um, it is relevant also in the context of, uh, as I mentioned, the incoming uh, NATO summit, because we will be focusing a lot on resilience in the, in the coming uh, years. Um, but it is relevant in general. It is relevant for the uh, um, uh, de debate at the, at the level of the EU as well. I will stop here and... Uh... Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Minister, uh, Minister Aurescu. Um, I will turn to, to the audience. If there are questions to either of the speakers, please raise your hand like the lady here and you'll be given a microphone, hopefully, by my colleagues, so you can, you can ask the question. It's coming. Be patient with us. 
And uh, please introduce yourself so, so we know who, who's asking the question. Thank you, Kim Dozier with Time Magazine. I wanted to ask the minister um, if he could get specific on what he would do to build the resilience of the communication and transport infrastructure and what specifically went wrong that you're referring to. And for the other panelists, how do you prepare for future pandemics when we're still recovering economically from this one? Does that mean taking from defense budgets or health budgets um, and diverting it? And once this crisis has passed, how do you make that argument? Because, you know, humans, we, we go with the next crisis first. Thank you. I will take one more question, if there is one more question, before turning to the panelists. All right. No, n not for now. Um, Mr. Torres, could you like to start and answer the question that yeah, the lady yeah. has um, asked? Well, I'm not going to give you um, too much of details uh, for the time being, but I think it's, it's quite uh, obvious that the um, um, transport infrastructure is critical. And it's critical not only for the um, uh, society, for the economy, but also in terms of uh, military mobility. So um, ensuring the um, uh, well, uh, resilience of the um, uh, infrastructure, I think it's extremely uh, important, mm -hmm. of the existing infrastructure. And of course, uh, uh, it is also important to promote new, relevant, uh, necessary infrastructure. As far as the communication is concerned, well, it's, it's absolutely obvious that well, cybersecurity and um, uh, well, the resilience of uh, the networks of communication is also key for um, well ensuring the well functioning of um, of um, um, the response to a crisis. For instance, we will focus also. We will have a, sp a specific um, community of interests for, uh, dealing with um, well the continuity of governance and uh, the ability to um, uh, cope with uh, uh, ongoing or. Mm -hmm well, um, sudden uh, crisis. So all these community of interests, communities of interest will work uh, in an interconnected systemic uh, uh, manner. But I will give you more details when they will, uh, they will exist, of course, in the, in the near future. No, thank you for the question. And um, let me tell you a little bit of context here. Because when we started to look into resilience some um, six years ago, we were in the logic of a whole of government approach. Because you need various agencies, you need the center of the government, you also needed sub-national entities because many nations are federal nations, big cities, big communities. But as we evolved with our thinking on resilience, we gradually moved and we are today at the issue of societal resilience, which means that this is beyond governments. This is the private sector, which is a, a hugely uh, important part of the discussion. Uh, and then, of course, is civil society and, and, and our public opinions, because that's also a matter of trust. That's a, a, a matter of this huge disinformation campaigns, these fake, fake news and, and these this invented stories that are so, so, so much over, over the place. So as we are shifting from government to societies, we are also looking into making sure that we understand together better by learning from each other. And that's the beauty of NATO as a convening platform. That's, I think, the beauty of the EU, as EU member states are sharing many things together. Because as we speak, in each of the nations, in America, in the US, in Canada, in Romania, in Sweden, which is not NATO, it's a very close partner of NATO, or Finland, I'll give you an example. There are FDI screening efforts. Some countries do have legislation for FDI screening, just to make sure that when you do something, you look into what kind of capital, what kind of trusted capital. And this is not only about who's investing in my ports, in my airports, in my logistics centers, but who, who's investing in my startups, who's putting money, and from which source is that money coming from when a startup wants to go and, and grow? Venture, venture capital. All these things are things that we just cannot do alone. We have to do it together. Of course, NATO, and I think not even the EU, we're not in the business of imposing things on nations, but to basically to develop common standards, these baseline requirements are in fact indicators for resilience. So this is something that uh, Maros also mentioned something which is critically important, uh, which is uh, our telecoms. There was a big discussion which will be amplified by the 5G uh, revolution or 6G. We already think of 6G. 
Or, or you can look also into what the Commission is doing, US is doing this, into what they call rare materials, the, the, the sources for our microchips, for our high-end uh, products, for space. So the idea is not basically to have a very prescriptive thing, but also to have a toolkit, toolboxes, that all of our democratic nations can share together, be stronger together. And I cannot emphasize how much I appreciate what the Aspen Institute here in Romania and the GMF Bucharest office are offering to the Romanian government in terms of private, public, non-governmental, the triple helix. So that's a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, as Minister Aurescu has said, we anticipate that at the NATO summit, there will be, of course, on many other issues, but on resilience, there will be renewed effort, and we're looking forward to engaging with, the, with this. Just a one word on, on the other side of the coin, because resilience is how you bounce back from a crisis, in, in fact. Okay, and how do you make sure that you get back to normal as soon as possible? But there is the other side of the coin, which is fragility. Fragility of our partners in many of the neighborhoods of Europe and of the transatlantic space is also something of concern. That's why in NATO we are engaging with the OECD that has been developing fragility indicators and we are now looking forward to engaging also with them, uh, also with the Commission in making sure that we do these things together. This is why this center proposed by Romania could be a very interesting way to help lessons learned, digestion, and implementation, and to, to basically uh, uh, reach out to the private sector and academia, uh, making sure that this is not just something coming from governments, uh, but it's also something from, from the depth uh, of our societal resilience. That's uh, the approach we have in NATO. Um, thank you. Um, I, would, I would add that there is a third side of this coin, if that is at all possible, which is the resilience of our opponents which is the resilience of the illiberal uh, um, um, systems, governing systems, which I think we also have to take into, into consideration. But uh, Vice President Sefcovic also probably wanted to answer the question. Thank you very much. Maybe I will, because both answers have been excellent, so I will extrapolate a little bit on that uh, medical aspect of the, of the current uh, crisis. I mean, when we've been, uh, I would say, the... the, the heat of uh, the worst moment, moments of the pandemics. Uh, we, um, we had a special uh, sessions of uh, commissioners every, every morning, nine o'clock, getting the latest briefings and preparing uh, for what to do next. And uh, what was, of course, very important part of those meetings being the discussions uh, we had with the uh, eminent uh, scientists, eminent virologists. And one warning which came from them, which I remember which I'm going to share with you was that it might be a sign that we are kind of entering the age of uh, pandemics because of the interconnect interconnectedness of the world and because of the, I would say, permanent human pressure on biodiversity. So kind of reducing the space where the animals are living because of agriculture, because of, uh, you know, um, expansion of our cities and so on and, 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 uh, and so forth. So we better be prepared for it. And I think we had really a hard lesson, as a, now I'm speaking about the global human community over the, over the last year. So what the, the lessons we have taken in, in uh, the European Union? The, the first one was that we have to uh, dramatically increase the production capability of the required medicines, of the, of, the, of, the, of the vaccines. And we kind of, I think, managed in a very short period of time to kind of uh, turn the tables around this question. And now we have, I think the latest is around 250, 260 million Europeans uh, vaccinated. But what is even more important at this stage is that uh, we are the, the, the only major economy exporting vaccine outside of the European Union and we exported more than 200 million doses so far. So more or less the same volume of the vaccines which we are supplying with uh, our member states, we are supplying also outside world. And I think uh, 
uh, that uh, we are going to use that potential also to continue being uh, the, I would say, major donor for COVAX and to make sure that this production capacity, which is in Europe, will be shared also with other parts uh, of the world because we know that until we get this pandemic in the control everywhere in the world, it will always come back and haunt us probably with the more deadly variants, with more transmissible you know, uh, diseases, and we just simply have to be ready for that, not only as a Europeans, but as, as, a, as, a global, sure. as a global community. On top of it, we realized that we would need to be much faster in developing new medicaments, in developing new, new vaccines. Therefore, we, uh, we are establishing uh, something which is called HERA, which is kind of new uh, incubator and accelerator for advanced uh, biomedicine research. Uh, in Europe, just simply to be, to be prepared uh, for this need to really make very rapid advancement in therapeutic medicines, in developing the, the new vaccines, in having the right scientists at the right place with the right amount of financial support, because I think clearly, uh, clearly this would be uh, needed. And currently we have in Europe uh, like uh, 50 production facilities for different kind of uh, uh, vaccines, because there are several stages and each one of them is uh, very important and uh, uh, we are kind of prospecting also other facilities across the whole uh, I would say Europe where we can kind of uh, use this European potential to or start the production or prepare uh, these facilities for the for the future uh, production so I think that would be I think very uh, very important for the uh, for the future and maybe the last point uh, uh, last point uh, which was made uh, 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 which was made by Alina on democracies. I think now we again see a little bit uh, uh, the shifting of the perception because at the beginning, you know, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, if you are living in the democratic country, it takes forever to take the decision uh, and, uh, you know, to decide and... Uh, uh, and, and, and simply, it's, 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 it's uh, the very, very long process. So I think the jury is out, but I think that we as a democratic world are doing pretty well if it comes to tackling the, 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 the vaccines, to that we mobilize the resources. We've been going uh, with a positive campaign to convince uh, our people, what needs to be done. The tough decisions have been taken in many of our member states. I think the lockdowns which, through which we had to live through across the, the member states have uh, been very difficult, but they've been adopted in democratic way, by democratically elected government, and it was respected despite of all the, of course, difficulties uh, which it comes with. So I think that uh, once we will be doing some kind of assessment, you know, how did we cope uh, with uh, this crisis, despite the fact that it was unprecedented, Nobody was prepared for it, and uh, that we had to deal with it in a truly uh, democratic way. I think we did well. We did well, and we just uh, uh, need to learn the lessons to do better next time, because unfortunately, now how you know the world is interconnected, that you can have the virus from one part of the world to, to land up in the plane just across the globe uh, within 10 to 12 hours is something we have, to, we have to cope with, and we have to be better prepared for it. Um, I didn't answer the money question. Uh, how much would this cost? We are now in the midst of one of the most massive, accelerated, structural transformations of human society in history. We never had such a compression of time and so many structural changes from geopolitics, from technological revolution to this pandemic, to the way in which we as human beings and us as democratic societies are looking at the world. So if I'm looking to where we are going, I would say we have four big dimensions like, you know, the North Star. One is, of course, the huge change that digitalization and technologies in its applications wherever, in every dimension of human activity, are bringing. That's a big, big reality. The second one is fighting climate change. Also in NATO, we are looking into the security implications of climate change, and this will also be a huge transformative force across the board. And by the way, this is beyond competition and geopolitical competition, because for climate change we need the whole planet including countries that we don't see eye to eye on many other things, on these things we need to work together. Then is resilience. 
which has a cost, but is not necessarily a governmental cost per se. It's a cost which is an investment because having more reliable supply chains, making sure that in times of difficulty you can service your population and you can really do the kind of things that you're supposed to be doing, this is also a cost that also the business sector and, and other segments will need to invest into. And then that's the third part, which is resilience. So you have digital, you have climate change, you have resilience. And then, of course, and not, not the last one, is national security requirements. Because that's something that will not go away and shouldn't go away. Because many of the other things I'm mentioning also do have a security, a national security issue. That's a big transformation in the thinking. Which of the, each of the governments around the world are thinking about these kind of things. So that's why when it comes to NATO, it's not for us to say, you should be, you ex uh, uh, private corporation, you should invest more in your, it's their sovereign decision. We are here to really give a more homogeneous, educated, transversal, sophisticated, and forward-looking mm -hmm. matrix of the factors, and then each of us, human beings individually, human communities, a small business, a huge global corporation, a small government, a small local government, a big national government, will be in the situation to navigate in a predictable way towards the uncharted seas of the future. That's why NATO and EU, we are so important, and that's why we need to work together even closer in complementarity, doing things together, because we are two sides of the same coin, the democratic West. And that's, that's why I, we do believe that this is our role is not to tell each one how much should you invest. It's not about defense spending here, which is a different thing. The Wales pledge is there, will be reconfirmed at the summit. That's a different story. But we are speaking about how human societies transform and also how can we uphold our democratic societies, which are a huge pressure also from within. Not every, every fracture in our society is, is produced by maligned foreign actors. Some of the things, the discontent of our public opinions are for real for causes which are ours. Inequality, impact of climate change, um, things that are basically short-sighted investments in, in, in many things. So that's, that's one of the most important transformative uh, periods in human history. And we are here to say that we understand the complexity of the problem and we are trying to find appropriate answers to that. Uh, Alina, if you yeah, just allow me two, two, more, two more points, uh, Mircea prompted me to, to this thought and I hope it would be interesting for the, for the audience because he was talking about uh, economic resilience and of course the, the, the crime, climate change. I'm also in many of my different responsibility, I am responsible for heading the European Battery Alliance. Why I'm mentioning it? Because in uh, this way uh, we are for the first time putting into the concrete legislative proposals the concept of competitive sustainability. Mm -hmm. Because we realized in the economy of the 21st century, if it comes, for example, for the manufacturing of, uh, of batteries, we, are, we do not want to compete anymore on pr uh, just on price. Because uh, simply we cannot uh, kind of factor uh, the low, low, low price as a only a determinant if we know mm -hmm. that uh, the low price was achieved at the expense of environment, at the expense of human rights, at the, at the expense of uh, uh, simply ruining the life of the generations which will come after us. Therefore, uh, what we are proposing in this uh, landmark legislation, and I hope that it will become the new global standard, is that, for example, each battery will have a digital passport. It means what is the carbon footprint of that battery? Mm -hmm. Were the critical raw materials sourced uh, ethically? Uh, uh, how they will be used uh, uh, after uh, the lifetime? What is the recycle plan? And so that it, it has to be the whole, I would say, value chain it has to be assessed, reflected, and that would be uh, our, I would say, competitive advantage of advanced economy. Did you use renewable energy? to produce it. Uh, you know, what kind of conditions 
being there for you know uh, producing these concrete products and i think that it brings us to another very big topic which i'm glad was very much supported uh, by the european leaders at the porto social summit that we just have to accelerate our thinking to go beyond gdp because if you look at traditional gdp uh, comparisons very often you are kind of uh, you know attributing uh, the value uh, of growth to the activities which have very adverse effect for the future of the planet and for the future of the mankind so therefore our work on dashboards therefore our work on these new data sets because we see it as a basis for you know measuring the the well-being and the growth in a new way which is much better reflecting the realities of the 21st century economy thank you thank you i will take one last question and then i will uh, come back to the speakers and ask you to answer the, answer the respective question and also do your last remarks so we can end on time I'm mindful of the time. I know that uh, Vice President Staskovic has, a, has an interview to do. Uh, Julian Kifu. Thank you very much, uh, Alina. Thank you. Uh, it was an um, excellent introduction and very much uh, uh, appreciate Kim's intervention. Uh, I would like to, to touch upon the resilience in the three layers because you've touched upon the whole of the government, the societal resilience, but actually, as we've learned, resilience has the three layers, state institutions, society, and citizen. By the way, in terrorism and in informational warfare, you can't do this without the three layers of, uh, of resilience. And I'm very happy that you've introduced Alina and we've heard comments on democratic resilience which makes sense so my question goes on on another very interesting aspect uh, aspect which is uh, trust you can't build resilience and taking on board all the three layers as much as long as you don't have a trust confidence from citizens into their governments and as we've seen in the, uh, lately including for the democratic governments there's a uh, actually a split between the political leadership and the natural elites and the, the professional elites of, uh, of the society. So in that respect, that, was, that, that will go my questions. How can you introduce trust into the, the mix of, uh, of uh, addressing resilience? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll be very interested uh, uh, to see how you can measure trust on the dashboards that Vice President Stavkovic is being, <laughs> being preparing. That's going to be quite a huge task. Uh, should we start with you, Mr. Julian? Yeah, um, I mentioned uh, to the previous question and to Julian's question that there is an evolution of the way in which we approach resilience and many other things. We moved from a few agencies inside national governments to a whole of government, and now we're looking to the whole of society. But there is thinking within nations inside NATO and also partners also from Nordic countries. I'm convinced that the center in Bucharest will be looking into this. We are now going even more microscopically, more granularly towards citizens' resilience. Because this is, in the end, the very essence of what is, in an aggregated way, a modern society. Mm -hmm. And you cannot speak of democratic resilience without looking into the way in which our citizens have trust in public institutions. And here you see a big variation of public trust within the democratic West. There are societies that are more homogeneous, there is more public trust human capital, social capital, other countries that are a little bit different. We cannot have one size fits all in nothing and even less so here. There is also another dimension of trust that can be measured, mm -hmm. but is not you know, measurable. Uh, so there are analytical instruments to measure that, but how to transfer that into real action, that's a more complex political issue, is the fact that we are also looking into community trust. So it's not about the citizen and the government. It's also us amongst ourselves. Do you trust your neighbor? Do you trust that when bad times happen, he or she will come to your rescue? Would you go to their rescue? Would you run the extra mile? 
eventually sacrifice your own immediate, selfish, national, whatever interest to go to the other. And I think this pandemic, in a way, exacerbated both sides of human nature. Selfishness and survival instincts in the first instance, and then a level of compassion, of solidarity, of love, in a way, in the good sense of the term. So the idea is for all of us to try to make their part in this, in this citizen, citizen resilience of sorts. Because, as I mentioned before, we are in the midst of a big conversation on not only on geopolitics, but also on the very essence of the organizing principle of human societies. Liberal democracies are perfectible. They're not a given thing. We speak about democrat the political democratic West, including with our friends from Asia Pacific and around the world, is not only uh, Europe and North America. But democracy is a perfectible proposition. It's not set in stone that you have elections every four or five years or whatever you, you have them. Look at America, how much uh, complex discussion is as we speak on, on many things that are part of that thing. The way in which we organize our economies is also part of the trust of our citizens. Capitalism is not a static proposition. Free markets is not a static proposition. Now there is a big trade-off between technology and governments, between citizens and technology, between all these things. So as long as we keep the fundamental DNA of open societies, which is permanent adaptation and transformation, recognizing that we have to do a better job in giving our citizens what they require in, in very explicit terms from all of us, political leadership or international organizations or whatever, that they are entitled to, to look for this kind of, of issues that make their lives uh, you know, happier and their kids' life uh, happier, then we'll have trust. If we don't do that and we just keep the mantra, we are good just because we are democratic and not work to our self-improvement, I think this is the most important lesson of the pandemic and of the migration crisis and of the financial crisis that we believe that, as famous people have said, that we were at the end of history when communists collapsed. No, we are just at the most complex transformation in human history ever. I still believe as a, as a Romanian and somebody has lived half my life in, in a different closed society that there is absolutely no substitute for freedom. There is absolutely no way for top-down authoritarian surveillance states to be more efficient in the end, more innovative in the end, that open free societies. Can I and, and that's, that's because <laughs> that's, I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting a little bit yeah, nervous when yes. it comes to this topic. <laughs> but so. it might be that others do not think the same, so it's our duty to, to continue to promote that. Um, I think I, I would put it in a more pragmatic uh, manner. I think there are two um, key things here in order to, um, to build trust. To build trust, of course, it's very difficult. To lose trust is very easy. Um, so uh, there is a continuous effort to build trust. And how to build trust? I think there are two ways. And one is, and they are not excluding each other, one is, um, well, being more efficient. And that's what we are doing uh, within NATO, within the European Union. We are trying to build more uh, efficient institutions. That's uh, this process NATO 2030 about, uh, and the new strategic concept. And the Conference for the Future of Europe is for the same thing. But it adds one more uh, aspect, which is participation the participation of the citizens in the process of making the institutions more efficient. Well, we don't have that directly as far as NATO is concerned, because uh, dealing with security issues is paradoxically um, easier from the conceptual way than uh, building, uh, well, uh, uh, well, help for the whole aspects, the rest of the aspects of the society, which the EU is doing. But the Conference for the Future of Europe is the greatest opportunity ever to bring all and every citizen aboard uh, for this uh, well, effort to make the EU institutions more efficient. 
So efficiency and uh, participation. If we uh, become more efficient, both NATO and EU, and also the member states of the European Union, the uh, well allies uh, uh, within NATO, our partners as well, because we cannot be uh, resilient and efficient without uh, our partners. We can't build trust in ourselves if we cannot be able to build trust um, for the partners in themselves. So all these are interconnected. So well, to close this uh, short inter intervention, I could speak more about, for instance, what we are planning to do within the community of democracies as presidency of this uh, organization. We have extended for one more year. So we have already two years and one more year by September 2022, the presidency of the community. We will um, work uh, together with um, our um, US friends, for instance, for the preparation of the Summit for Democracies, which President Biden is willing to, um, um, to organize. Um, but beyond that, I think the key to, um, uh, well, the answer to um, all this, uh, in order to, be, to, cope to, the, to cope with the challenges of, uh, of the post-pandemic world are a stronger EU, a stronger uh, and more efficient uh, NATO, um, building uh, strategic resilience for both the organizations, the member states of the two organizations, and for the uh, partners, and working with like-minded partners in the world. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this is not, uh, well, the whole answer, but I think these are the main elements. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Stefkovic, you have the last remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Jan's opened a very fundamental question, uh, trust and support of the, of the public opinion. Because when I was responsible before for Energy Union, uh, we had a lot of international discussions on, on, on climate change, on uh, I mean, canvassing the support for the, for the Paris Agreement. And when I was listening to the, to the foreign leaders, they always told me, I mean, for you in Europe, it's easy because you have such a strong public support mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for, the green, uh, for the green policies. And uh, of course, it's true, but of course, you have to work very hard for, for, for having it, that uh, the people have to be convinced, uh, they, they have to be ready to support it, not only, I would say, in declaratory terms, but also in what we see are quite important uh, industrial, behavioral changes through which uh, the, the Europe goes, because it's really the big uh, transformation which affects uh, uh, everyone. So I totally agree with the, with the minister that uh, to earn the trust, uh, it's, it's very difficult and you can lose it uh, very, very quickly. And in this aspect, I just would like to bring one additional point, and, and, and this is that, that I think we have to invest as much as possible in our youth and to find a way how we can teach better these digital natives the art of critical thinking, the art of, uh, of assessing the information which is sent to them through different algorithms to the Facebooks, Instagrams, or you know, other uh, social media platforms. They are not just uh, uh, taking this as a given, that they should uh, really look for other sources and be a little bit critical about what they are reading about, because uh, we see how you know, this, uh, uh, these opinion bubbles are uh, very often bringing huge divisions uh, in, in the society and, and, and we see it uh, everywhere. And therefore, I think the part of the curriculum for the 21st century should be not only, I would say, digital skills, but also critical thinking of the information which is uh, on this platform presented, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, to all the generations, but we know that the youngsters spend most time on, on the digital platforms. And I think that, uh, and I'm very glad that the minister was uh, so, so precise and uh, uh, explicit about the conference on future of Europe because it's a new opportunity. It's a new new way which we are starting how we want to discuss and debate with Europeans. Uh, if you have a time, uh, visit the digital platform because it's the first time we are using artificial intelligence for almost automatic translation. So the Romanian can discuss with Estonian and with the Slovak at the same time in their own languages and it's automatically translated. And I think it gives some kind of you know, special mm -hmm. attraction to the tool. But what would be very important uh, from us to support it and to bring to the discussion the topics which are interesting for the people. Uh, I know that there are some topics which are interesting for the people living in a Brussels bubble, but I know that in all corners of Europe, uh, the people would like to discuss other things, like you know, future of jobs, future of the industry, the perspective of the region, uh, what will happen with a city in 10, 15 years, and what they have to learn to be always uh, uh, very much uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a good side of that competition on the, on the labor market. And that's, I think, the, uh, the opportunity we have, and uh, hopefully we will, we will use 
use uh, that conference on the future of Europe for advancing, you know, the democratic thinking and the way how we adopt uh, the decision in Europe. But thank you very much for the invitation. Thank it you. was, it was a pleasure you. to thank be you here. Thank you for, for appearing on this panel. I think we managed to cover quite a, quite a, a good a number of issues which are going to be discussed further throughout the next three days. It's been a wonderful uh, set of the stage. Thank you, the three speakers. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs> Merci for